Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay, our next speaker, which is actually our last speaker for this room, because after this is going to be the awards ceremony in this room. So our last speaker is just coming up now. This is Landon. He's going to be talking about making competitive games fun for everyone, which sounds lovely. Ah. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, I just uh, have to load my document on this computer, unfortunately, because uh, I don't know if I need it or not, but it's got everything I want to say on it, so if I get lost, then I can like look at it. Because um, this is my first time doing a talk. I've never done one before, so hopefully everything goes smoothly. Um... Okay. Why is it? Okay. All right. So. <laughs> um. So my talk today is about uh, making competitive multiplayer games fun for everyone, or I guess rather, uh, probably a better name for it would be uh, making them fun for non-competitive people. Uh, so like, you know, if you're not good at video games, you could still have fun with it. Um, so uh, my name's Landon Podbilski, uh, by the way. I guess that's, that might be important. Hmm. Uh, there we go, okay. So these, these are some games that I'm not very good at. Um, chess, StarCraft, Street Fighter. Um, these are games that have uh, a steep learning curve that are very difficult to master uh, and that people who are good at them are very good at them. Um, I think that they're a bit like flying model plane, which is another thing that I'm not very good at because uh, if you mess it up, you sort of really mess it up. There's no coming back from it. Uh, that can be kind of stressful, honestly, because, like, you know, that's not good. I don't want to play StarCraft and feel this way. Um, so this is another list of games. Uh, these are games that I like and also games that I'm really bad at. Um, but these games, on the other hand, reward you for simply playing them. Uh, they don't require you to be good, necessarily. Uh, they're a bit more like Hungry Hungry Hippos, uh, which is my kind of game. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so if everything goes wrong, you can still have fun. I mean, this looks better, really. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of this, like, uh, whirlpool of games that uh, I like. What the heck was I supposed to say on this slide? I don't even know. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, my talk's going to be about games like this. Why I like them, why StarCraft's a good game, but I don't like it as much. Um, so let's start by comparing the differences between these games and uh, games like StarCraft and Street Fighter. Uh, in my head, anyway. Um, so StarCraft has certainty, calculated moves, limited set of choices, ensuring there's always a plan of action for any problem. So at any point in those games, you can look at something and say, this is what I should do right now, or if you mess up, you can say, that's what I should have done. Uh, in these games, there's uncertainty. There's way too many choices, often not enough time to always make the right choice. So while you're playing those games, it's sort of just a bunch of stuff thrown at you, and when something goes wrong, there's a million things you could have done. Uh, but none of them are perfect. So those games have focus, limited number of characters and weapons, function over fashion for art and game design. Uh, they want you to look at all the parts, see all the parts, understand how they work. They want you to know the inner workings of the game almost. Uh, these games, though, are uh, sporadic. Way too many characters and weapons, wacky graphics, weird levels, enough stuff that if you don't like one thing, you'll probably like another thing. So... You don't need to, uh, oh yeah, yeah, you don't, need a, you don't need to like everything 
in these games. In a game like StarCraft, if you don't like the way StarCraft plays, you don't like RTSs, something like that, then there's nothing for you in StarCraft. And if, you, if you're not good at fighters, there's nothing for you in Street Fighter either. Um, finally, uh, those games have a hardcore fan base. So everybody who plays them is very good at them. They take balance very seriously. Uh, these games, not so much. These are like party games. Uh, they attract novice players. So often when you play these games with people, you're playing with people who don't know what they're doing or they're not there to win, right? Um, so I made a game called Duck Game. Uh, it kind of works like one of these. Uh, it is a competitive multiplayer game. Um, I spent the last three years working on it. There's a trailer for it, just to give you an idea of how it works. Okay, so um, yeah, it's kind of an old trailer, but it's still one that I like because it has all the stuff. Um, so that's uh, the game that I spent the last while working on. Uh, it's relevant to this talk because it's pretty much uh, does everything that I'm trying to vocalize here in terms of uh, what I want out of a competitive multiplayer game. It tries to make choices that uh, keep it from being too competitive, uh, sort of in the name of fun. Uh, we will get more into that. So this is some screenshots for it uh, that I had prepared just in case we couldn't do the video. So you can look at them now, but I mean, we don't, we don't need them anymore. So yeah, the video played is what we just observed. Uh, we're going to talk about some other things that we just observed in the video there. Uh, so one thing, there was fire. Fire is an important part of Duck Game. Uh, there was dumb luck, so sort of like that. Uh, on top of that, there was uh, precision shooting. So now this has changed from somebody, you know, dodging something strange to somebody dodging somebody's malice, I guess. Um, yeah, swords. Swords is important. Um, hats. So. Obviously, that improves this whole scenario. And all together. <laughs> so this is pretty much what Duck Game is. This picture like, outlines it really well. This is about all you can say about Duck Game. Uh, and I really do feel that in more ways than one. Uh, so let's, let's look at these parts individually. So this is just Kermit here uh, with his rocket launcher firing his bullet. So you'll notice right here uh, we have like a region of fun. So you can see he's got the sword. Uh, you've got a bit of Kermit in there and his launcher there. So uh, this part too, you can see the region of fun's here. So, you know, this is where the curiosity lies. This is where uh, obviously they're avoiding all the hazards. And finally, yeah, there's a region of fun there too, even though this guy's on fire. Uh, so all of these you can see 
directly uh, disconnected from each other. Each player has their own region of fun that doesn't interact with the other players necessarily, which lets each player have a good time, uh, irregardless of what the other player is doing. So this is the uh, emotion graph here. You can see the anger on that side, but also you can see that he's having a good time because he found a rocket launcher, and he's mad at uh, player two here because player two is really cocky, and he was about to like solve that, right? So player two is feeling a bit cocky because player two manages to avoid getting killed all the time. Somehow, they don't know how. Stuff like this. Uh, they're also surprised and uh, excited by what they've just found on the ground, whatever it was. There's a whirlpool of emotions going on in Player 3. <laughs> Player 3 doesn't really know what to do. So, uh, there's, there's deeper meaning in Player 3, which we'll, we'll cover later on. Uh, for now, uh, we're going to go back to the differences, but... Uh, I think there was one more thing first. Yeah, okay. So uh, check this out. If I make this, uh, this scene more like, uh, like a skill-based game, like without the party elements, uh, so we clear this up, and now uh, we'll do the same scenario where something, something happens, but this is, this is not a party game. So he fires. Uh, she activates her shield, so it rebounds off, right? Because, I mean, she knew it was coming. You can't trick her. So, uh, but he actually saw that coming as well. So he, he, he did it to rebound off the ceiling because he knew he, she was going to deflect it up there. So, like, this guy just gets wasted. He can't even do anything about it. And, I mean, a motion graph's a lot more simple. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone's feeling pretty good. Except for this guy here. He's never played the game before. He doesn't even know what he's doing. Somebody passed him the controller said it would be fun. But... <laughs> and we will get more into him again. But we're going to go back to the differences more specifically. Uh, this list of differences, you could say, you could look at the left side and the right side and say, well... The games on the left look like they're good skill-based fun, right? Like solid, no, no crazy stuff. Everything's predictable and, and good. This side, you could say it's all slide whistles, right? And just ridiculous and nothing makes any sense. And it's only fun for people who, uh, who want to laugh, I guess. Like, you know, if you're good at games, you don't even want to play these games. But I feel like all of these games have a similar level of skill required to these games on the left side, just uh, I'm going to break down how exactly I think that they can have both at the same time. They can be fun games and they can also be deterministic and skill related. So Worms requires a feel for aiming system, knowledge of a vast array of different weapons and unique uses. It also has complex movement that requires you to figure it out so you don't die just by moving around. Because Worms is a complicated game, it's very hard to play. And, I mean, that's at the same time what makes it a very fun game. Uh, because there's too many weapons, so you can never get really good at using all of them. There'll always be something that you're not good at using. You'll blow yourself up with a rocket launcher, try the ninja rope, and just kind of not be able to do anything with it. Um, so, yeah, and it's got spectacular failures. So when you do screw up, it's hilarious. And you don't even feel bad because you get to watch yourself screw up so bad. And everybody else gets to watch, and everybody laughs at you. Uh, and then wind. Wind is kind of just thrown in there as like a, even if you're really good at the game in Worms, the wind's there, so, you know, you're screwed anyway. You can't win. And I think that's great because, you know, sometimes it doesn't affect you, sometimes it throws you right off and somebody else gets a good hit in. Uh, Smash Bros. Good fighting game. It's got all the fighting game stuff. It's really hard. I'm really bad at it because it requires a lot of attention and there's a lot of mechanics to master. Uh, it's also got tournament, tournament options for players who want to take it more seriously because they're aware that some people are into that. Uh, but also, it's got too much stuff, just like Worms. There's so many moves and characters that uh, usually if somebody's really good at one, you can find another character to exploit the weaknesses of that one and back and forth and back and forth until, you know, everybody's won at least one. 
Um, you also get to play as a bunch of video game characters who should not be in the same game uh, and see what they do to each other, right? So, like, that's fun for everyone. Like, even if you don't like fighting games, it's fun to watch Pikachu and Zelda, like, kill each other, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Smash Bros. is fun. Uh, it's Time Splitters 2. Uh, it's a, just a first-person shooter. I mean, it's, like, solidly implemented. It's hard like first-person shooters are. But, again, too much stuff. Too many weapons, too many levels. Uh, if you're bored in Time Splitters, you can set it up to give everybody rocket launchers and everybody's monkeys, and they're all fighting on the moon. And, I mean, one way or another, you're going to have fun with the game, even if you don't get it. Finally, uh, Duck Game, my game, uh, that I tried to sort of do something similar with. Uh, I tried to have some sort of a balance. So Duck Game also has many weapons, many levels. Uh, it's difficult to play. Um, but uh, it's also silly because it's got weird weapons that screw you up. Uh, it's got too many weapons, so you forget how some work, or you get levels where, uh, where everything is just set up in the first place to be a problem, just random boxes. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, and it's got gameplay features that serve no functional purpose, which we'll go into. So, okay. Uh, Duck Game has a number of anti-competitive features. Uh, what they are is uh, random levels and random boxes and presents. So... What, they, what those are is levels that start and players get nothing but presents or nothing but random boxes. So they have to pretty much rely on luck or running away from somebody who has luck in order to win. Uh, these levels don't come up very often, but when they do come up, they sort of mix it up in such a way that somebody who's been having a bad time can have a really good time. Uh, there's a rock throw. And how that works is... Uh, at the end of uh, every match, or like every 10 rounds, you'll play 10 rounds, and then you get a rock throw. And what the rock throw is, is it shows you what your score is. So all the ducks throw their rocks. However far the rock goes is what your score is. Um, what this does is it offsets the scoring to the end of the rounds, so that while you're playing, you're not paying too much attention to uh, what your score is in the game. You, you can kind of forget it. You can lose track of what your score is so that when the score screen comes up later, uh, that's when you're like, oh, man, I'm doing better than I thought I was, or, man, I didn't get any at all. I thought I did really good. Uh, but it, it, it takes focus off of the score. It makes it less important so that you don't have to, uh, you know, it, it's, not the, it's not the end of the world if you don't have a good score on the screen. Um, there's no ranked multiplayer. Uh, that's on purpose, because ranked multiplayer makes people take a game seriously, and then people taking a party game seriously can lead to bad stuff, like people uh, thinking that the game is unbalanced, for example, where everyone says, well, why, why do you play that? It's got all kinds of weird stuff going on in it, right? Well, we avoid that. <laughs> uh, leveling system based on time, not skill, so... That just involves filling up an XP meter not based on how many kills you got because uh, Duck Game tries not to reward people for getting kills or winning matches or things like that. You do get the trophy at the end, uh, but there's absolutely no long-term benefit to winning a match, uh, and people can like throw something at you and steal your trophy at the end anyway, so... Um, Quacking and musical instruments. Uh, these are really important uh, because they're not really anti-competitive so much as they are completely useless. They don't do anything, but they're there, and they sort of they're there to remind you that the game is silly and that it's not for winning all the time. It's not for getting the gun first. Sometimes it's for you know what did I just pick up? A saxophone. It does saxophone stuff, and you start to realize like maybe that's okay. Maybe it's okay that it isn't a gun for now. <laughs> so, yeah. And stuff like this kind of reminds players that that game is not about winning. It's about having fun. 
and fire, which we talked about at first, which is very important. Um, so this guy, from the first one, the reason I bring him up again is because it doesn't look like he's having fun, does it? I mean, he's on fire, he's got a sword and a cool hat, but he's getting shot at. He's not doing anything. He's not even looking the direction of the people who are shooting at him. He's completely oblivious to everything. But one thing you'll notice about him is that when he pushes the B button, notice up there, see the little toast? It comes out the top of the toaster. So this whole time, he was having fun because he was quacking while he was on fire, getting shot at, doing absolutely no useful purpose in the game, but just sort of mesmerized by the toast coming out of the toaster, which sometimes is enough, right? <laughs> so, I don't know how long it's been. Half an hour? 20 minutes? Uh, that is most of what I had to talk about in terms of uh, multiplayer and duck game. Uh, again, I apologize. My first talk, I didn't know how long it would take. <laughs> um, but there are some things that I would like to bring up uh, just related to uh, my experience while working on duck game and things that I think are important to know. Uh, one of the biggest things is online multiplayer. So there's lots of talk about people doing local multiplayer games. They release it. Uh, the game doesn't do well. Nobody buys it, right? And it's sad because the game was great. Uh, and honestly, I feel like one of the biggest problems with that is lack of online multiplayer. Uh, Duck Game, if it didn't have online multiplayer, I don't think it would have done nearly uh, as well as it had done because everything that I see in Duck Game, all the screenshots that people take, all the content that's made, everybody I've ever talked to online plays the game online. Because not everybody has friends that they can get into the same room, right? You can't get four people together all the time. Sometimes, even if you... Like, some people, they don't have anyone to play video games with. Other people know four people, but they're all over the world. So, this is the only point of access to a local multiplayer game for some people, and even if you do have friends you can get together, sometimes you won't buy the game because you don't know when they're going to get together, right? So you'll put it off to the side and say, well, I'll buy this later when we have a party, and then kind of just never happens. So the reason why nobody is implementing multiplayer is because multiplayer is a nightmare. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to implement. Uh, there's tons of problems. It doesn't work with some games. Some games are just too competitively oriented for it to even make sense. Like uh, Things like Towerfall, I think if they implemented online multiplayer, uh, it might not work because people take it seriously enough that when they were playing online, uh, nobody would be having a good time because they'd be paying too much attention to the things that they did that didn't work because of lag, right? Um, this is, uh, just in case anyone's a programmer here, uh, there's something called server prediction code in online, which is, uh, it pretty much prevents cheating by making sure that your game knows what happened and can reverse so that you can essentially stop cheaters and correct lag and things like that. As an independent developer, I recommend avoiding that entirely because it makes everything way more complicated and all it does is stop cheating, which uh, most likely people are never going to do in your game anyway. This, is, this stuff's only an issue for massive, like, million-dollar games, right, where everyone's supposed to play them competitively. And uh, I guess where a bunch of random people are supposed to play them competitively, where nobody can be trusted, right? Because everyone's going to cheat. And... I feel like more and more that's becoming less and less of a thing, and you can still have fun with a game if it doesn't have that. Uh, the game will never be the same online. This is, this is the truth for any game. Uh, duck game is the same. I don't like playing duck game online. It messes everything up. Uh, it's still fun, but obviously you lose a lot of the feel. A lot of the cool stuff you could do is a lot weirder. Um, 
just due to lag and due to some things just not being possible online, like physics vines and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I already covered that. Without online multiplayer, I don't think Duck Game would have sold, uh, regardless of, of uh, how good it ended up being. Uh, and finally, I guess uh, I'll end the talk with um, some stuff that I think as an independent game developer because I like to tell this stuff to people because some people don't really think about it and they, they're curious about you know what other people think, what goes through people's minds when they're developing video games and why they do it. Uh, so... Yeah, these aren't rules. This is stuff that I feel personally. Uh, knowing how to program is really useful as an independent developer. Because even if you're not the main programmer, uh, if you have an idea and you can implement it into the game before anybody even knows if it's good, then you can throw it in there, you can play with it, and you can know without tying up weeks of a programmer's time, right? Like you can, it's really useful for a designer to be able to, to do that. Um, so it's mostly about quick turnaround on new features. Uh, forcing yourself to work could be a bad sign. So if you have a game that you want to make and you're working on it all the time and you keep thinking, I don't want to work on this game at all, but you keep forcing yourself to work on it, I think that's important, but you need to come through cycles of, you know what, this game's cool. I like working on it, right? I want to work on this game. Uh, if you go through months and months of working on a game and hating it the whole time and never having any joy working on it, you shouldn't work on it. You should work on something else, right? Like, don't ever think that you need to finish something just so that you have something finished. That's not as important as finishing something that you like. And be willing to keep trying no matter what. If you really like game design, if you really like game development, you should keep pushing at it. Because you will succeed. I believe that 100% from the bottom of my heart. That if you keep trying and you really love doing this, then everything will work out for you. And game development's hard. And that's why it's really hard to overcome this stuff sometimes because making a game, even for people who love making games, is sometimes not very fun. There's a lot of stuff you have to do that you don't want to do. Features you have to implement. Uh, art you have to make. And... I mean, some of my favorite stuff in my games is stuff that I grew doing for, like, weeks. And I finally got it in and realized that it was, it was great, right? So, just when, when it's hard, you got to keep, keep pushing, right? And you got to like it. You got to like making games. That's, like, the most important thing. I don't think anything's more important than that. And they think... Maybe that this is the last slide. And my mouth's really dry. I should have brought water. <laughs> so this is, this is the promo out for that game that I put up here because uh, the artist I got is really good. I think his work's great. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll open up the floor to questions. Does anybody... Oh, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm currently developing uh, um, a party game with my company, and I had two questions. Okay. Uh, uh, how important do you think uh, online multiplayer is? Online multiplayer? Be, yeah, to Im implement it. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, like, I guess if your local multiplayer game has some sort of single player, then that's a lot better than nothing. Like, as long as there's something that people can look at and say, if I download this, it'll be worth playing on my own if I can't find anybody to play it with. Um, otherwise, though, like, if you feel like your single player is weak or it doesn't have any single player at all, I feel like online multiplayer is 
practically mandatory if you want your game to succeed. Like uh, things like Towerfall were able to succeed without online multiplayer, but uh, just looking at how well Towerfall did and just thinking about how much better it could have done if it was capable of having online, uh, I, I feel like hitting with a local multiplayer game in ways like Samurai Gun, Towerfall, Nidhogg have is much, much more difficult than to hit with something that people could play without people in the same room. So it, it pretty much just, it's, it's not mandatory to have online multiplayer, but I think it really, really helps your chances of, of getting your game out to people. All right, and the second question would be, uh, how did you approach Adult Swim, or, or, or if they approach you? Uh, how, how, yeah, um, how, how did it go? I actually, uh, Adult Swim had uh, approached a friend of mine uh, who made a game called Super Puzzle Platformer. Uh, they had published his game, and I'd done music for it, so uh, I'd kind of worked with them in the past. So while I was at GDC, uh, I went and found one of the Adult Swim people, and I happened to be able to get the duck game there at a booth, so I, I asked them to come over and play the game because I knew that the game... Uh, was going to need a Steam release eventually. I was working with Uya, and they were specifically Android, and I had an exclusivity period of like a year or something, so I wanted to set something up for when I could get it on PC because I felt like that was important, and uh, they helped me do that after I, uh, I contacted them myself at the show and showed them my game, so that's, that's what it took. Uh, thanks. Hello, thank you very much. Um, how can uh, a competitive games, competitive gameplay, can really cause a lot of uh, uh, great retention on the players? People want to come back for comp competition. How do you get your players to come back? Uh, sorry, what was the last part of the question? How do you get your players to come back to your game? Ah, um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, since it's uh, Pretty much, uh, like people, people uh, when the game came out, there was uh, an online community that built up just with people who were playing the game and uh, had just got it and was still experiencing all the new things, figuring out the new levels, stuff like that. Uh, after a while, it starts to slow down because less people are playing, less people are seeing it on streams. Uh, that's the period where more people start coming back to the game because of things that they missed. Uh, maybe features that they hadn't found, maybe gameplay stuff that was unraveling, like, uh, for example, people figured out that when you're flapping your wings with a gun and duck game, uh, if you press fire just, like, a frame after you start flapping, you can do an angle shot of 45 degrees, uh, and that kind of changed everything, so people start using stuff like that, they start using strafing, uh, so that's, like, kind of the second wave of getting people to come back, I think, is just having depth in your game. And then the third wave, uh, I would say, is, uh, is update content. So we actually, uh, I've been working on an update for a while, uh, and I updated the game multiple times after release. And uh, each new update that I did that added a number of features, you'd see sort of a boost in the number of players online because people would come back, they'd see their game had updated, and they'd be curious what was new. Um, and on top of that, uh, if anybody works with uh, Steam and you have the ability to do a free weekend or something like that and your game's appropriate for it, uh, I highly recommend that as well because uh, we did one for Duck Game just uh, a couple of weeks ago and the number of players went from 300 online to around three or 4,000 online during the free weekend. And when it dropped off, the number of players was at 600 instead of 300 for a few weeks. So it sort of, it doubled the player base just by having that free weekend. Any more questions? Ah. Um, when would you consider something to have, or when, when would you consider it to be too much depth? So when would it be like, too difficult to learn, such as a fighting game, like Street Fighter that you said, or um, the versus the like the the forty five degree flapping shot that you described. Um, I guess m my uh, 
My problem with difficulty is when uh, a feature is difficult and also you can't do without it. Like in Duck Game, you can make a lot of progress not doing the angle shots. The angle shots are almost kind of flare, right? Like they come in every now and then for you to get cool kills that everybody looks at and says, whoa, that was wild. I didn't even know you could do that. But if you don't do them, like, like I know a lot of people who are super good at Duck Game who are never doing them. They say like, oh, it's too hard. I can't figure it out, right? Um, whereas a lot of the higher level stuff in uh, the games that I'm not very good at is uh, really, really good and really, really important for you to uh, be able to play the game competitively. So pretty much the point where a feature becomes uh, mandatory and is also difficult is when, uh, when I have a problem with it. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Uh, well, thank you, for everybody, for coming to the talk. Um, I apologize if uh, I didn't do it as well as I could, but I got a lot of practice here, and uh, I appreciate you all uh, sticking through it, and I hope everybody was able to learn something. Thank you. Thank you.